Good, good evening and welcome everybody to the NYC Film Green Office Hours. My name is Shira Gans and I'm the Senior Executive Director of Policy and Programs at the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. For those of you not familiar with our agency, we're the city agency that supports all the creative sectors in New York City and permits all on location film production here. So I'm really excited for tonight's session of Film Green Office Hours. Film Green is our program that helps promote sustainable film production here. We offer a framework for what it means to be sustainable. We offer tips and resources on decarbonizing, managing waste stream, educating crew, and tracking your data. We also offer resources like this, discussions with experts in the industry that dig into really important topics central to sustainable film production. So I want to thank everyone who's here tonight for the discussion. I want to thank our awesome panelists that I'll bring on in a moment. I want to thank Earth Angel, who's been a partner in putting these on since the beginning. And without further ado, I'm excited to bring on our folks. So can you guys turn on your cameras? Okay. Hi, everyone. So tonight's office hours topic is an evening with the Sustainable Entertainment Alliance. And I have some esteemed members of the Alliance here. So I'm going to let you guys quickly introduce yourselves. Uh, Sam, why don't you kick it off? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Sam Reed. I am the executive director of the Sustainable Entertainment Alliance. So I have the pleasure of working uh, with our members in the industry on, on all things sustainability. Shannon, why don't you introduce yourself next? Hi, uh, Shannon Bart. I work at Netflix. I'm on the sustainability team and I lead our efforts on decarbonization across our global productions. And Audrey. Hi, Audrey Van Tang. Um, I lead our sustainability strategy at NBC Universal. Um, so that's our pathway to carbon neutral by 2035 across our parks, offices, studios, and film and TV production. Great. And I will say some of you on the flyer, Kat from um, Amazon MGM was supposed to join us, but unfortunately at the last moment she had a conflict. So it'll be us for talking tonight. So I guess, you know, I just want to start by kind of leveling the playing field and explaining what exactly is the Sustainable Entertainment Alliance and how did it come to be? So maybe Sam, since you're the, the director, executive director. Yeah. Can, uh, yeah. <clears throat> Happy to. Uh, so the Sustainable Entertainment Alliance, uh, formerly known as the Sustainable Production Alliance, uh, has has been around for for over a decade and stemmed from a lot of collaboration happening uh, between studios and also the Producers Guild of America, um, and has sort of grown over time. We currently have eleven members, uh, which include A twenty four, Amazon, Apple, Disney, Fox, NBC Universal, Netflix. Uh, Paramount Global, Sony Pictures, Warner Brothers Discovery, and Village Roadshow. I'm getting very good at doing that off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, and we work with our members on uh, sustainability, both in production uh, and also increasingly in how uh, we can support the representation of climate and sustainability in the content that gets produced on screen. Uh, so we work sort of with our members to align on, on measurements and best practices, uh, while also providing resources for use by our members and folks across the industry. Um, and I think, you know, started as, as, as and continues to grow because our members see a lot of value in this collaboration uh, and, and aligning on these things allows us to, to push sustainability forward across the board uh, in an industry that um, it is constantly changing and growing and adapting. Um, so that is sort of our, our background. And I guess maybe Shannon and Audrey. So I think when I first, you know, was learning about SEA, it was a little bit um, counterintuitive to me that competitors in the market might be working so collaboratively on something that could involve cutting edge technology or different strategies. And so in a, we were talking before, you said this was in the pre-competitive phase, which I liked that idea. And so I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit more about how your companies came to participate in, in SEA and how you see that as part of your role. I don't know. Audrey, why don't you go first? Sure, yes. Yeah. So we've been um, long time uh, early members of, of the Sustainable Entertainment Alliance. Um, and in the world of sustainability, there's actually a lot of uh, these types of collaborations. Um, you, we see these also were members of the Clean Energy Buyers uh, Association. So 
Um, there's many different ways that our companies uh, collaborate on sustainability because it's something that needs industry-wide um, changes and in, in availability of, of products and services and tools and um, the very sort of origins of, of SEA were around establishing best practices to make sure that um, you know, one studio wasn't asking something different as another studio, that we all kind of were, were speaking the same language, using the same carbon calculators. Um, and so that's uh, still our mission today. Great. Shannon, anything to add? Oh, very similar to Audrey. I, Netflix, um, we're involved with a lot of, in a lot of different sustainability um, collaborations. It definitely, especially in the entertainment industry, is just so helpful to be working together pre-competitively because we all, we all share the same crew, the same supplier um, base, the some, some creators even. And so really tackling this approach together is how we're all going to go further faster. And so how do you guys, I mean, well, one, do you have particular focus areas right now? And then uh, I was looking at some of your tools and reporting, so I have some insight into it, but could could you talk about what those focus areas are and then a little bit of how you guys arrive at that and the process of reaching consensus, if there's any kind of challenges in that capacity? Yeah, I can I can start that off. I, I would say our we have sort of four main working groups that we collaborate on. Um, so one of those is focused on on clean energy uh, and engaging with sort of how we are decarbonizing our, our productions. Uh, one working group focused on circularity and materials and sort of how we are both reducing waste uh, and increasing circularity across productions and, and uh, across the industry. Uh, we have a working group that's focused on, on content and storytelling and sort of how we are connecting with audiences around uh, climate and sustainability. And then we have a, a fourth working group um, that's focused on sort of industry outreach and coordinating um, both with our members and with others in the industry to support. Um, and, and I think in terms of our collective approach to this, I think of it in sort of three main buckets. One of those is is sort of standards and measurement. So we do a lot of work around aligning on how we are measuring our emissions a, a, and measuring those footprints. We put out a benchmarking report uh, a couple of years ago, and we're going to be releasing a an updated version uh, in the months to come that sort of looks at the average uh, emissions benchmarks for different types of productions. So we do a lot of work to align on how we are calculating that and how we are are sort of sharing that out so that we can identify not just uh, how much emissions are coming out of this, but where more importantly, where those emissions are coming from and what the highest sources are. Um, in addition to the sort of standards and measurement piece, we do a lot of work around innovation. So identifying emerging technologies and hearing from, from vendors and suppliers in the space who uh, are, are unlocking sort of innovative practices that that we can take advantage of. Uh, and I think the third main bucket is sort of this resources. So we um, maintain the, the green production guide, which stems it out of our collaboration with the Producers Guild uh, and includes, you know, a carbon calculator and a best practices checklist and a lot of resources for sustainability on set. Um, so we help maintain that uh, and sort of provide those resources to the industry, to our members, but also to um, the industry at large. That was a lot of information. So well, one question that occurred to me, I'm very impressed also for all of our viewers. Sam just got back from COP. He's on <laughs> very little sleep. So we have I to- mildly jet lagged. Yes, but, um, commend him on best. all this information coming through jet lag. Um, so for all of you guys, is your remit like North America or what happens? Are, is Does it represent kind of global production? So can you clarify that just as we talk about the work you guys are doing? Um, sure. Uh, so I'm on the global sustainability team okay. and um, our climate target, which we'll, we'll get into in a little bit, is, is okay. global um, and our productions at Netflix are global. Um, I My team directly supports the productions that Netflix directly produces, which tend to be um, more in the US, Canada, the UK, and then some outbound productions around the world. But uh, my team also supports production management teams and Netflix teams globally and oh. support them with their local decarbonization strategies. So it, it is a global approach. We have different levels of touch depending on um, how close Netflix is to producing the content, but mm -hmm. it, it is a global strategy. Got it. And Audrey, is that similar? Yep, very similar. And then this is maybe really, sometimes I get a little in the weeds, but just from a measurement perspective, I mean, are there challenges in 
different units of measurement and how different countries are doing that? Is there like a global language that folks have landed on in terms of carbon calculation and things like that? I can I can start with that one. I would say one of that's one of the things that we are increasingly working on is, is sort of improving that alignment. Uh, obviously, there's different regulatory frameworks in different countries and in the EU and England and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but one of the things that we have done at the Alliance is earlier this year, we released uh, a white paper defining the minimum boundaries for, for scope three emissions and how we were calculating those across productions. And we are currently working on uh, a sort of another version of that that looks more specifically at scopes one and two and sort of identifying the, the boundaries there. And for that work, we are also collaborating with our friends across the pond, uh, BAFTA Albert, who do a lot of similar work based in the UK. Um, so we are increasingly working to make sure that we can, can align on that, uh, in particular for sort of on the production level, um, because those are very intertwined processes. So um, that is definitely some uh, a key focus of ours. Got it. And so... When I was looking over the website, you know, beyond it being, I think, very interesting that it's this alliance of companies who might be um, competitors working so collaboratively, I also noticed that there was input from environmental organizations like NRDC or Rewiring America who were kind of giving scripts or insight into how to um, informing some of the work you're doing about sustainable storytelling. And so I thought that was interesting to see those folks both in that space um, and then also as part of the alliance. So could you talk a little bit about how you come to work with um, organizations that might be research organizations or might be seen as advocacy organizations? Yeah, I mean, I think for for the most part, especially with our work on the on the storytelling front uh, and how we're representing climate and sustainability on screen, one of our sort of core objectives is to support creatives who want to tell these stories, and that means connecting them with with advisors or experts in the space who might be able to to help them out at, and identify sort of key areas. So NRDC has a program called Rewrite the Future where they offer script consultations uh, with their sort of network of climate climate experts and scientists. Um, Rewiring America does similar things around sort of electric on screen. Um, so we are trying, we position uh, the sort of resources uh, to support these creatives who want to tell these stories and, and help connect them to the experts who can figure out, okay, this is, you know, if you're writing a script about uh, a physician in Florida, here is how climate might be impacting them and what the effects might be and how those communities are adapting uh, and, and sort of better make that connection between the character and the, the climate environment that they are living in. Got it. Um, so before I move on to, I want to talk a little bit about what's happening at NBC Universal on Netflix. Is there something on this kind of overarching discussion about Sustainable Entertainment Alliance? Have we missed any other features you guys want to, not that you can't bring it up later, but no. Okay. So Shannon, I know like Netflix kind of has a reputation as being at the forefront of this, like a driver of um, work on, on climate change. I know it's really central. So I'd just be curious to kind of you know, hear about your approach to it. I know you've also been in this role for a long time. So any insight you have as to either the shifts of of where it kind of sits in the discussion when something's being produced or just in how it's approached, you know, I think would be interesting to hear. Yeah, well, I'll share a little bit about our approach to sustainability on production. Um, I've been at Netflix for almost four years now. Um, Netflix did come a bit late to the sustainability space in the oh, entertainment am I wrong? industry. Um, and so, uh, we're, we're making up for it with ambition and speed. Um, okay. so we, we, uh, in 2021, we came out with our climate commitment, which is to have our emissions in 2030 compared to 2019. Um, so decarbonizing our operations all in scope one, two, and three, as well as, um, bring our remaining carbon emissions starting in 2022, onwards to zero by investing in the power of nature to capture carbon. So those are, those are our two climate goals. A lot of the work I do in production is in that first part, that decarbonizing. Mm -hmm. And so um, at Netflix, um, the on most years, the majority of our emissions are from the production of film and series content. And okay. so it is a, a big focus of our sustainability efforts. And we've identified four ways to decarbonize our productions. Uh, that's energy efficiency, sourcing renewable energy, 
using clean mobile power, which means phasing out diesel generators on our productions and transitioning to electric vehicles. And those are really the four areas we're focused on production. And then the two ways we're looking to um, really cut those fuel emissions on our productions, the amount of fuel a production uses is through clean mobile power and electric vehicles. And so I know there was like a point where during the pandemic of supply chains and among other things were suffering, there was an anxiety around whether or not there was going to be this pipeline for for the um, BESs, as we were saying earlier, the battered, battery energy storage systems, which is not battery uh, generators, um, and other components for EVs and things like that. So is that something that is still an issue or was that something that has sort of, is all that stuff flowing in a way? We saw some COVID supply chain disruptions for both EV charging stations, um, EVs, and and some clean mobile power, but those seem to be largely resolved now from what I can see, which is great. Um, We were looking ahead at how are we going to make sure that this equipment is available at scale to our industry. And um, there were a lot of different clean mobile power solutions out there and there are now and we're using them um, around around the world and in New York. Um, but there did not seem to be quite yet the larger power um, sources that will need to really transition away from diesel generators. So um, a couple of years ago, Netflix, along with Disney, co-founded the Clean Mobile Power Initiative, which is um, in partnership with RMI and their tech accelerator third derivative where they're really bringing in startups and helping to bring new clean technology to market um, made for our film industry to deliver us that 208 volt three phase power that our industry likes to use and need and and really get that um, deployed across our production. So I think we definitely felt that supply constraint, Shira, and that's why we we were partnered with a tech, tech accelerator like their derivative. Oh. Um, but overall, we are seeing this technology continuing to become available, which is really exciting. Yeah, that is cool. And so then, Audrey, would, at MB's Universal, how would you describe kind of your focus area? Or is it the same or a different approach to sustainability? Yeah, um, certainly very similar. Um, our program, I'll, I'll start first on the in front of the camera side, just to change it up a little bit. Um, so we first kind of think about the kind of inspiring stories, um, the kind of storytelling piece that that we were touching on earlier. So that's um, really thinking about, you know, how can we uh, show climate solutions on screen? Um, You know, in New York, we have Al Roker, America's weatherman, who um, does the Today Climate series, where he showcases specific things that are happening um, in New York or, or around the world. Um, And we also have the Universal Greener Light Program, um, which is uh, integrating sustainability from script to screen. So thinking about sustainability early in the development process through script reviews, conversations with filmmakers, all the way through the physical production side of things, and then out um, all the way into distribution and marketing, um, thinking about public service announcements, how can we kind of uh, talk about uh, and inspire others to to take action um, in their daily lives. Um, And so then behind the camera, Uh, is what I think we're focused on here during this conversation um, is really how do we um, empower our production teams to integrate sustainability practices um, on set. So we have the longstanding NBC Universal Sustainable Production Program, um, which is currently across about 100 film, uh, TV, and sports productions a year. Um, And we just uh, at the start of this year implemented uh, the sustainable production standards uh, to really move the needle on fuel emissions um, and material conversation uh, conservation on set. Um, So that's requiring specific minimum metrics um, are achieved uh, in order to really make sure that we're seeing the outcomes that that we want to see. So um, really kind of moving beyond individual pilots of clean technology and scaling things. So to what Shannon was kind of talking about and, you know, starting from a couple pilots to really making sure that we have, you know, 5, 10, 15 of these units on production. Um, So that's something that I'm really excited to see more and more of this investment um, in clean technology. Um, but, you know, there's, there's still um, a, a long way to go in terms of some, some things. There are definitely limitations to how far some vehicles can drive or the size of certain batteries. Um, so I think it's an exciting time uh, for more developments. For sure. 
Um, so one question I had, I know this is a big focus for a lot of um, the studios and content creators, is this idea of sustainable storytelling and to, you know, the previous conversation about NRDC and these other groups. And I know you guys are really um, data driven. So I was reading some of your, you know, benchmarking of what the emissions were looking at uh, a variety of, of shows and movies and things that were being produced. And so that's why you kind of focused in on fuel and decarbonization because you saw that was driving it. So in terms of the focus on sustainable storytelling, I'm, is there research or data that um, drives drives the storytelling? I mean, have you seen uh, instances where, where these types of things were integrated into scripts and then through focus groups or, or whatever the data collection is, you saw a translation into shifts in behavior? Because I thought, yeah, it'd be interesting if you guys could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, I can I can take that one. I think sure. um, there's sort of two two angles to that 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 I think are are both really important. Um, one is the sort of uh, way that audiences are connecting when they see these stories, and there are groups like Rare that have done some really compelling research around um, what impact that has. So uh, they have done looking at sort of okay in a scene where a character orders a plant based meal. Uh, versus a scene where one doesn't sort of what impact does it have on people's perceptions of of plant-based meals and, and done a lot of really compelling research on that um from our side the the work that we do is, is really helping to connect our help our members understand how to best connect these stories with audiences uh, and really make the case that these stories can be creatively and commercially successful um because i think you know, if you write the perfect story that engages with sustainability, but no one sees it, it's not going to uh, make much of an impact. Um, so that balance of, of the creative and the commercial success of this. And so one thing that we have done is we just released a, a great video that is a sort of highlight reel of ways that stories of mainstream entertainment have engaged with this. Uh, it was voiced by uh, the one and only Meryl Streep, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. So if you go to climateonscreen.org, um, you can watch that video there and it sort of gives a, a good look at sort of how these are happening already in mainstream entertainment. And it doesn't have to be this sort of doom and gloom, climate change is happening and we're all doomed, but sort of showing acts of resilience and how people and communities are engaging with this and, and sort of making it really creatively compelling and we also on that website uh, on climateonscreen.org have put together a, a collection of, of resources and research and advisors like NRDC's Rewrite the Future or Good Energy that can support storytellers who are trying to bring these stories to life. Um, so, and I would say we are continuing to invest in research on that front, in particular understanding sort of what audiences connect with these stories, what uh, what stories are, are successful. Because I think from a business perspective for many of our members, uh, being able to make that case that that these are stories that audiences want to see. And Rare's done some really great research that showed that, you know, seven in 10 Americans want to see more content that engages with climate and sustainability. Um, so we're continuing to invest in that uh, and both sort of from a, a business perspective and also a tracking perspective to see where these stories are coming from, where they're being successful and all of that. So um, definitely a, a focus of ours that we're hoping to grow uh, as we go forward. That's great. So I see you guys kind of really bringing a lot of expertise on the technical kind of behind the camera side, um, like a rigor to analyzing your different like up to scope three and, and to see where the emissions are coming. But it's also great to see that you guys are taking that same kind of rigor to really look at the qualitative side and say, OK, how can we bring kind of technical expertise and the science behind this into a creative process to make it more authentic? So. That's cool. Um, and so I guess, you know, in your guys' work for Shannon and Audrey, is there a specific project that you could um, share that you feel like exemplifies or, or that you're proud of that that integrated a lot of the stuff that you guys have been working on, like a good showcase for some of the work? It could be all of your shows, but I mean, is there one in particular, one project you guys want to highlight? Audrey, do you want to go first or do you want me to? All right. Um, I guess I'm off mute. So I volunteered myself. Um, we, you know, I, I think what I'm pretty excited about is the uptick in clean tech across all of the productions we, we are touching, we directly produce. It's, you know, um, I think in like over 2022, 2023, we had about 60% of our um, direct productions using the clean tech. And then now in 2024, it's all of our productions where we're all, we're using them, all of our direct, all the productions we directly manage 
are using clean mobile power and reducing diesel generator use. They um, are all using EVs at some capacity. Some are just cars, some are using vans, and now we're even stepping into the truck space. And so it's it's getting really exciting. Um, cool. We are uh, we are we like to think about how we integrate clean tech as taking a crawl, walk, run approach. And when we've been trying out pilots and seeing how it's working and getting feedback, that's really when we're crawling. And now we're preparing to start walking, right? We're starting okay. to see productions um, across the US, Canada and the UK um, reduce their like their overall diesel generator use by 40, 50% or even more in some cases, which is really exciting. They're using a mix of solar powered base camps, large batteries, small batteries, hybrid generator units. In the UK, we're also using hydrogen power units powered mm. leveraging green hydrogen. And so we really, and we're accessing the electric grid more, which is the most effective and, and best way to, to get power when you can on location um, and just being really efficient where we can. So I think that's been really exciting to see. Whereas a couple of years ago, you know, it would be a big deal if you reduce your generator fuel use by 10 or 20%. Now we're seeing that, you know, 40, 50%, which is super exciting. On yeah, that. that's awesome. Congratulations. Okay. Um, I definitely agree with, with all of those things. And um, I think just to, to change it up, the thing that I will always be proud of is our asset warehouse in New York. Um, so the, the NBC asset uh, re-center is essentially where uh, you can bring um, all of your set walls and your props and your set deck and even office furniture um, back at uh, wrap and then uh, goes to the next NBC show for free um, at no cost of production. So that's been a long time program that I think um, I've always been proud of. That is great because last office hours was about sustainable set design and this big challenge in New York of not having any place to store um, components of your set. And so then I guess, Sam, to pivot to you, we've been kind of touching on it, and then maybe as we're talking, we could put it in the chat. Could you talk a little bit about some of the resources that um, Sustainable Entertainment Alliance has created? You've, you've talked about some of them, but in case we've missed them and how folks who are watching might um, avail themselves of those. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so sustainableentertainmentalliance.org is our new fresh website. Um, uh, and we also have maintained for a long time the greenproductionguide.com. Uh, so you can find on, on either of those, but the sustainableentertainmentalliance.org is our sort of uh, fresh new website. So on there are a ton of resources for both production and storytelling. Uh, on the production side, we have some core tools like the uh, production Environmental Accounting Report, or PAIR, uh, which is a carbon calculator that is a spreadsheet that any production can use to track uh, their emissions uh, and sort of report on that. Uh, and then we also have the Production Environmental Action Checklist, aka the PEACH, that is a, a best practices checklist um, that we are have been maintained for a long time. We are getting ready to roll out a new version of that uh, in the in the coming months that sort of has updated on, on, on new practices. Uh, but that has a great guide for sort of across departments, sustainable practices that, that folks can take on and things to think about and things to sort of run through on a checklist as you are uh, running a production. Uh, and, and there's also a, a, a load of other resources on there. Uh, there are signage that you can print out to, to hang at set to, to show sort of where different waste uh, goes or, or how to coordinate that. There's um, training opportunities. Uh, and then on the on the storytelling side on climateonscreen.org and also on our main website, um, there's that reel that I mentioned earlier, but also a collection of sort of resources like like tip sheets uh, for ideas on, on ways to integrate sustainability into a story that you're trying to tell. Uh, research into uh, how um, how this has been done and, and how it's been done successfully. And one project that I'm really excited about that we've been working on with the University of Southern California that'll come out uh, in, in another month or so is a database of research around uh, climate on screen that looks at things like how audiences engage with it, what the business rewards are, what the sort of um, impact you know frameworks are. So we are continuing to sort of build out that research and you can find a lot of that on, on climateonscreen.org. Um, as well as the the sort of advisors like NRDC's Rate the Future or Good Energy that folks can connect with. 
Uh, and we also try and source opportunities like development funds or or fellowships or programming uh, opportunities for those who are trying for a little extra help to get their story off the ground. Um, so we really use climateonscreen.org as a, a resource hub uh, to support creatives and to support our members in, in bringing these stories to life. Um, so lots of resources on there yeah. uh, and on our website, you can sort of look through depending on what you're trying to do. So if you are looking to decarbonize your production, you can search for resources based on that. If you're trying to reduce waste, if you're trying to empower your crew and, and educate folks, um, you can sort through those resources in a bunch of different ways. Uh, so those are are available and we will continue to um, keep adding to those. I think that's, that's one of the things that uh, I'm really excited about in the sort of Days to and months and years to come is, is continuing to work with our members and across the industry and increasingly hopefully working with the unions and the guilds to identify what are training opportunities, what are new resources we can create. So uh, we definitely encourage folks to to get in touch um, as we continue to build those out. That's great. So it's like you guys are not only creating resources that you share amongst yourselves to improve kind of the business case. Um, but you're also sharing with the larger creative community. So that's great. Um, so you all either work for or represent organizations that are filming all over the world. We, I'm from the mayor's office in New York City. So I want to talk a little bit about um, New York, which is a unique filming environment, I know. And so I guess if you guys could talk a little bit about what are some of the specific challenges um, that you face, say, filming in a place like New York. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of benefits, right? We have amazing crew here. We have, like, the most iconic skylines. It's the best place ever. Um, but I know it's also, you know, it's like New York's ethos is sort of like the, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. So it's sort of like baked in that things are hard. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about, you know, some of the challenges, and then we'll get to some of the, the solution. So who wants to kick off? Kvetching, too, is like a big New York thing. So you can kvetch about... Be in New York now. <laughs> um, well, I'll I'll first start with something amazing that's happened in the last year. Love it's it. The <laughs> renewable diesel availability. Yes. Um, that I know a lot of amazing people probably here on this call um, and through the mayor's office worked on uh, with the producers guild and um, the and a, a lot of yeah I can't list all the people but. Um, I think that has been really helpful for productions that are right next to that station, but having more of that in more stations um, would definitely be um, helpful so people aren't having to crisscross to, to go to that specific station to refill with renewable diesel. Um, so I think it's- There is it's a station just, in the Bronx that just got it. Yes, I, I heard, yes. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and I think um, in, in general, I think that's probably the the trend that I'm seeing is just there's a lot of amazing things happening. How can we have more? How can we have it at scale um, available um, throughout the city? Um, so you know we're seeing those small uh, battery units and become kind of standard in uh, grip and electric kits, um, which I think is is really great to see. Um, and uh, you know we're seeing. Uh, electric battery trailers and solar uh, battery trailers that can run um, all day without being plugged in. But, um, you know, we're only seeing them in certain types of trailers. So how can we see them in all types of, you know, not just uh, single room trailers, for example, but um, in, in others that we use. Um, so probably it's, I think that would be the, the pattern of just more, more, and more. <laughs> You can see you're based in LA because I asked you to complain about New York. I know, just like I really can't, positive. I can't actually, yeah, it was really sad. It was nice. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're based in LA too, but do you want to take a stab at complaining? Yeah, you want me to take a stab at complaining? Yeah, I mean, you, don't, you could also be super okay. positive, which is fine. <laughs> I don't want to keep you um, from being positive. You're so funny. Uh, well, okay. So I first of all, I would like to kind of just give this tie back to. SEA and how important it is that we work together because when new things come to the market like renewable diesel, it allows us to once kind of voice the demand for it together, but then also share it among our productions very quickly. Um, I know there was a lot of people that worked on that, um, including your office, Shira, and and the and the PGA, which was fantastic. But really just sharing those things is great. I agree with Audrey, like small batteries is becoming really normal in New York City, which is super in, in terms of having it like almost fully power set in a lot of locations. I know it's been really helpful in Central Park and on the subway and other places that it's really difficult to bring in generators. So you have those kind of production agility benefits to that. Um, 
to be honest, New York is behind in other types of clean mobile power. And it's been yeah. only in the last, I would say, few months that you have uh, a few suppliers starting to bring in the larger batteries that we've embraced mm -hmm. so much in other parts of the country. So it's really exciting to see that come in. You also have some hybrid units. That's where a battery is paired with a generator and can really, it gets recharged by the generator, but it really significantly reduces how much fuel is required to power. So that's starting to come into New York, which is exciting. Um, and we are starting to see more, like we've had a base camp be powered by a large battery um, and that's supplemented by solar powered trailers. And yes, they even work in New York, which is- Sunny here. Amazing. Um, yes. And and so, yeah, so like, I think New York is slowly starting to, I wouldn't say catch up, but at least follow behind and keep okay. walking in this marathon. And, and it's exciting to see kind of the light bulbs go on um, when chatting with crew and and everyone there that are like, oh, wow, this is this is great. This is really helpful. Um, EVs are also a little bit more challenging in New York due to the lack of just baked in EV charging infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It has been really helpful to see some of the charging hubs pop up um, around the city. And I know some of our productions are using those fast charging hubs that are, are coming online. So that is helpful as well. Um, and we also temporarily install EV charging or bring it with us when, when okay. we need to. But I think um, just the nature of, of filming in New York, you know, not having necessarily the, uh, as much charging available or as much space available, um, it can make it a little bit more tricky to figure out how to integrate. But then once you do, you realize it really benefits the production yeah. as well. So I guess, I mean, the, the renewable diesel example was really interesting because I think, you know, sometimes a challenge is uh, like silos or lack of dialogue. So because someone flagged that for me, I was able to kind of bring in our office and another city agency to be at the table, not necessarily to take any, um, you know, concrete action, but just to have us be there as part of the discussion, I think facilitated um, kind of ease concerns about introducing uh, renewable diesel before there was this um, market set up as we figure out our clean fuel tax situation, um, credit situation rather. So I think like, you know, we're all on this call. So if you guys had your wish list and thinking about, well, what are things that like municipal governments could do um, to help facilitate good actors like yourselves who are trying to film more sustainably? Like, have you seen either things you, you think New York could be doing that are feasible or things that you've seen other cities do that aren't, I mean, obviously New York's a little bit unique. Like I saw someone in the chat talk about how in Vancouver and um, Toronto, they've created these big kiosks, which are great, but New York City streets, especially since the pandemic with our outdoor dining programs really can't accommodate, you know, that level of street furniture between our kind of iconic kiosks where you can get, you know, candy or magazines and then city bike. And then just like everything, there's, it's just not really viable. So, um, all to say, are there examples that you could share that you've seen from other cities or that you think that New York could be doing that would be helpful to the cause? Can be, yeah. I think the one, I, I know we've talked about it before, Shira, but on the material reuse side of things, right. I think given, um, you know, yeah, limited storage abilities and, and um, wanting to make sure that every material finds a home at wrap, um, having more places um, like materials for the arts where we can donate or, or bring, you know, pull back, uh, you know, kind of create that cycle where <coughs> we're using it and donating it to it. Um, I think more programs like that are, are also great so that we're, we're thinking about kind of holistically beyond just energy on production. Yeah. I will plug that we uh, at the mayor's office of media and entertainment have underwritten two positions at materials for the arts, which for folks who don't know about it is a great organization. That's part of the city's department of cultural affairs. That is a, a reuse facility that has not historically focused on film and television where anyone can drop off anything and they find a place for it through their membership, which is um, teachers or members of city agencies or arts nonprofits. And so 
we've now worked to to fund these two positions where they actually go on site um, to productions and help do these kind of fire sales in some instances where they'll send out a notice to their members who can come on location. And in some cases, they, they do bring it back to their facility in Long Island City. And we, they've really collected an impressive amount of, of tonnage. Um, so we plan to keep keep underwriting those positions and trying to build those collaborations. Shannon, your thoughts or things you've seen that you think would be important? I, I mean, I think accessing the electric grid power, however the city can make, can help facilitate that is really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we need it to power our sets and our operations, but even more so as we bring in more battery electric storage systems or buses yes. and, and um, more electric vehicles will need to act. It'll be best to keep accessing grid power. So, you know, identifying where are the busiest areas, where are most of the base camps parked, um, where are areas that you could help to increase charging or access to that charging to recharge batteries, making it easier to access grid power. Um, I think those types of things will always pay dividends um across across productions and i know we you started this question with we can't do electric kiosks but you don't have to well, you yes. have to do them exactly the same right, way right. that yes. the other cities are doing them to still i think provide access um to infrastructure sure or helping um production facilities get access to more power if that's something that's needed so they can start to install fast charging as well got it um, Sam, is there anything you wanted to add to that or the one? No, I think New Yorker? Jan and Audrey are, are the experts on that. Okay. So, we'll leave that so I guess moving on a little bit to big picture before we get to some of the questions from our audience. So, you know, looking ahead, um, this seems like a rapidly developing field. Are there kind of specific innovations that you guys are most excited about? I mean, Shannon, you talked about kind of carbon capture. So there was another... So a lot of my time is also spent on music industry work. And there was a company that um, I met who was helping to for for large scale live events. And what they were doing was researching just very specific types of carbon capture to kind of try to mitigate some of the issues around um, carbon credits and do really know if your offset did anything. Um, and so they were looking at like kelp. Um, farming and one other specific kind of carbon sequestration. And so all of the all of the money that any of all, all the carbon offsets just went to these two projects because they had kind of determined that these were in their estimation, like the one of the most effective ways to, to capture carbon. So I wonder, like, you know, are you seeing any kind of technologies like that as you invest in in carbon capture? It could be anything else that just captured my imagination when I heard about it. Well, I'm not our team's expert in okay, carbon <laughs> comp projects, but I can say okay. that um, if you want to see the projects that we're investing in, they are all listed in our ESG oh. report, um, yeah. which is on our website. Um, you can go to sustainability.netflix.com to find that report. Um, we are we we do do a lot of vetting and invest in the power of nature to capture carbon. So there are a lot of nature-based projects as well as the destruction of potent gases, such as methane. So a number okay. of our projects are also destroying methane, which is really important for action in the near term. So, um, and and we we do have high faith in our, our projects. We, they're, they're heavily vetted. Um, and we, cool. we have blogs out there that talk about that whole process too, that I, okay. I don't know well enough to repeat here. Yes. So I'll point you to the information that, that's available. Um, but yeah, it's, I think that we need to do everything. Like we need yeah. to our emissions. We need to decarbonize as we've been discussing on this production. We need to reuse materials as, as Audrey has been talking about so so beautifully. And we need to um, in save our, protect our nature that is doing a lot of this hard work for us and and helping to maintain a livable planet that we, yes. all, we all want to be on. So yes. I, I, I think that it's all important and um, and I guess I'll leave it at that. Okay. Audrey, is there any specific thing that you've gotten you very excited? Not that it's better than other things, just that, you know, it's captured your interest. Um, let's see. Well, I would I would say uh, an, another one that we haven't quite mentioned yet here is um, we are 
deploying more and more, especially in New York, uh, reusable uh, container systems for catering and craft services, mm -hmm. um, which I think is a really um, neat opportunity that we have in New York, given that you the way we're kind of set up, we can easily kind of send it back to where um, the kind of headquarters of where the reusable dishware gets washed um, every night and it kind of comes back. Um, that's cool. So that's something I think um, crews have been really excited to see and just sort of creates that culture of sustainability on set. So, you know, when you walk in, you kind of, you get your reusable dishware, you see all the three stream bins, you, um, you know, hopefully don't hear a generator running, everything is nice and quiet and it, it's a, a good uh, work environment. And so then I guess one other big picture question before we switch to the questions is, so you guys have been doing this for over a decade, which means you've spanned um, three administrations. And so as a government person, I'm always interested in, you know, how your work shifts or doesn't shift based on potential changes in regulatory priorities or structures. So could you talk a little bit about how like regulation drives your work or if it's more or the other factors like I've heard Chan talk about it was just good for business and just you know kind of if folks would talk a little bit about about that. Yeah I can I can take a first crack at that. I mean, I think, you know, obviously the various regulatory frameworks affect the way that that we, our members report things and, and engage with the sort of metrics piece of it. But I think what's been really inspiring to me, uh, and I apologize in classic New York form, someone is really laying on the horn outside of my window. Uh, so apologies if that comes through. Um, but I, I think there's, uh, you know, the, the, the thing that has been inspiring to me about working with this coalition of, of companies is that uh, there is a commitment to this that is not stemming from, oh, we have to report on it, so we have to do this. It's yeah. because there's a real belief that this is going to be better for businesses and also better for our planet. And I think that that is going to be consistent, and that is sort of where our focus is, is how are we using sustainable practices to to improve you know the business environment and improve our planet. Uh, and I think the the sort of use of clean mobile power in place of diesel generators is a great example of that because obviously there are emissions benefits to that, right? Where <clears throat> you're not pumping out diesel uh, emissions, but there are also, you know, benefits to the health uh, of people on set, not breathing those fumes. There are benefits to the sound on set and, and being able to set those batteries up closer to base camp uh, and not having to lay that cable really far away. There are right. benefits, you know, diesel generators are not the most efficient use of power. So, it's it is both there is the sort of emissions component to it that we are reducing the emissions by pivoting from that but there are real benefits to both the the businesses but also the the crew on set and the people working in this industry um that are another motivation for doing this so that those motivations are the same no matter what the sort of government apparatus looks like around it that is heartening to hear that we are somewhat irrelevant whether we change um, so I'm going to shift to some of the questions from the audience. We have one from Anu, who was actually a guest in our last one. So he said, what metrics or resources do you have for set construction and design? Is that something you guys have either at, can I say SEA, or do you guys prefer, is that an acronym you're using or no? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you, can, you can definitely call us SEA. I would say, uh, you know, I don't know that we have metrics just yet, although that is sort of uh, we have started discussing what frameworks around that could look like. In terms of resources, one of the projects that I'm really excited about that we are working on with our materials working group, and I knew we should connect because um, we have been collaborating with the Art Directors Guild uh, in LA based on this, uh, is trying to identify sort of a list of problem materials. So materials that are hard to dispose of or hard to reuse uh, and working with, with the Art Directors Guild out there to look at both what are alternatives to those materials uh, that we can use in place that are either more sustainable or easier to reuse, uh, but also what sort of different practices are to, to avoid that or, or ways to increase circularity. Um, so that is definitely a, a project that I am very excited about and dig deeper in and would love to sort of collaborate and, and get the, the East Coast uh, brought into that as well. So here's another question kind of similar where someone who works in an art department and film and TV in New York City has said that They've seen kind of coming out of COVID, but still this increase um, in ordering online shipped packages. So they were wondering if anybody had any strategies you've seen about how to decrease, um, you know, the footprint or that practice. Uh, 
You guys can also look too and find the ones you want to answer. <laughs> well, I've been, I was leaving it for Audrey. I yeah. mean, you beautifully yeah. described your asset center, right? For using yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it, it's obviously always a challenge when you're, when you're shipping things, you know, there's way to, ways to bundle order, but the more you can source locally, the better um, from either uh, asset centers or uh, thrift stores or, um, you know, materials for the arts or other places where, where you might be able to um, match, uh, find a match for what you're looking for. Yeah. So we've also had productions just chat with each other. Like we have a lot of activity right yeah. now in New York and New Jersey. And, um, you know, we've had a lot of modern day series going on and they're really sharing a lot of materials between productions. So maybe the recommendation is asking, you know, if you're at a studio or production company asking them I know there's still like I think Art Cube still active in New York I think that's been a great um, I think part. she's in Atlanta now but I think she still is active here the web yeah, list serves the email yeah. the list serve and stuff like I think like <laughs> checking to see if it's available first or what you need is available first is always good for us whether it's in our personal lives or in our professional mm -hmm. lives on on film and series helps to reduce that shipping absolutely and so then here's a question about, um, I guess, for Netflix, but I'm sure it is for NBC as well. So if you guys are producing more rural areas, like what are some of the strategies that you're using if it doesn't support EV or if it's like not? Yeah. And then I guess yeah. another question I wanted to ask, too, I'm going to add my question in, because I always think about like the grid, like New York's grid isn't particularly clean. So if you have like a solar powered battery, right, is it actually better to plug into the grid? which is drawing on not clean sources of energy or would it be better to run on like a solar powered bass? Okay. Again, I know you're not great the technical question. person, thanks. Which is so, kind of connected to this person's questions, but not exactly. No, yeah, no, it's great. So, um, so we do, yes, we film, we have major production hubs um, where a lot of our filming takes place, but every once in a while we do film in, you know, interior Canada or other parts of the US. Um, and there we've been pretty successful installing temporary EV charging or even more permanent EV, char EV charging, um, bringing along charging with us. So it's not always, um, New York is kind of, you, you need some public charging just because of the nature of the city. But right. in a lot of places, space isn't an issue if you can imagine that space not being an issue. And in some places there is enough available power even at the studio. And so we have been pretty successful installing temporary DC fast charging, even temporary mm -hmm. level two charging, um, bringing that along with us. Um, and, and so that has really helped. There are some productions where we are using, you know, EV cars, vans, and trucks. And there's some productions where we're only able to get a couple EV, EV cars in there and then more plug-in hybrids and hybrids. Um, we have EVs at least at least a couple on every production but the um when we are in a place that has very very long driving and not as much um charging then we might go to a plug-in hybrid um to to continue to save fuel but they it is uh i think that don't be scared if your studio that you're at or your location doesn't have a lot of existing charging infrastructure it's now possible to either rent or purchase um temporary fast charging that you can hook up to either 480 volt power or pair with a rented transformer and just hook it up to 208 240 volt power and so um it it's been pretty cool seeing that progress That's there cool. and then to answer your question shira thanks um yeah the grid mix is different in every state uh -huh. and it's it is definitely cleaner to use grid power than um a generator and um and more efficient because the the you know the power plants would be, would be more efficient that way um specifically your question about renewable energy versus grid power i think you'd have to look at the exact <laughs> location but the reality is is that solar power depending on how you're using the batteries mm -hmm. solar can be good for topping off solar um and there are a number of solar trailers available that um the solar does really keep the trailers charged but I'd much rather have you also then recharge trailers at grid power versus running a generator, which is another way that sometimes 
batteries get recharged, which is still better than um, using a straight up generator. You're still saving generator hours and such. Yeah. Um, but we do take that all into account when we're calculating our emissions reductions across our productions. We do look at, for example, if we're replacing, um, you know, a generator running for 14 hours at 500 amps and it was like a 1600 amp generator, are we, what are we replacing that with? And then how is that getting recharged? Um, and, and what is the mix of the grid there? And then we calculate how much how many tons of carbon we saved through all this process. Mm -hmm. And we actually do publish that publicly as well in our ESG reports. That was a very fair answer. Thank you. Um, so one person asked, is there a certification process? And I will say, you know, Film Green, just to be clear. So if you are a film that is shooting in New York City and you want to get the Film Green seal, that is basically Film Green provides kind of a architecture for what it would mean to be sustainable. And then if you can show that you've engaged in sustainable practices and you get the film green seal, which you can run in your end credits. Beyond that, I don't know. I mean, there's Emma, but I don't know if there's like um, the way in some other industries, like a third party kind of gold standard that you can bring on. Like Earth Angel that I mentioned earlier, you know, who's been a partner with us, they provide eco production um services and then they'll give you a report and things like that but i don't know like do you guys know is there you know like a third party certification yeah i mean uh, that's sort of we use the the peach our best practices checklist as a guide for sort of best practices around sustainability so i think and that is you know the peach is what the environmental media association uses to to award their green seals and gold seals so i, I don't know that it's a specific certification process because that requires some real sort of auditing and, and verification. Um, but we certainly have a sense of what the best practices are and following those best practices is going to make for a, a much more sustainable production. So the sort of an official seal that says this is certified as a green production requires lots of, of auditing and third party verification. Um, but being able to understand the best practices and implement them and programs like film green that sort of reward those practices are really important towards towards lifting this up sort of across the industry great so i guess on that what someone asked um how are you engaging in educating production teams and talent to pr prioritize and incorporate sustainability in their daily operations so Go ahead, Audrey. Uh, yeah, so we we do uh, at, on NBCU Productions um, have uh, basically all crew sustainability training sessions um, early on, um, either kind of in the last week of prep or first week of production. Um, so this year we were just counting the numbers. We I think we've had over three hundred. Uh, crew members take that training um, and 30 cast members take that training. So we'll do like smaller ones for cast members directly um, who want to learn more about sustainability. Um, and we just kind of talk through both what sustainability is, why it's important to production. Um, and then we specifically have heads of department present on what their sustainability plans are for the production so people can kind of engage uh, in what's going to happen over the next coming weeks. Um, and so we found that that's been um, really impactful for people to kind of raise their hand and say, I want to learn more about this. How can I help out? Um, and hopefully leave um, with, with a little bit more information than they came. Cool. So a lot of people are asking um, kind of regulatory but incentive questions. Like, are there Obviously, there's a huge market for film tax credits um, where states are, you know, competing with one another and localities across the globe. Um, so are you seeing, I know New York has not done this. Um, have you guys seen places where you get either film tax credits that are tied to sustainability metrics or are there other sustainability um, incentives that you could, that you guys are leveraging to reduce, you know, your tax burden? Without getting too in the weeds. Sam, do you want to take, do you want me to take that? Uh, if you've got one off the top of your head, I was going to mention New Zealand, but uh. yeah. Um, well, Austria has a five percent uplift to their tax okay. credit um, for meeting certain sustainability criteria. Germany requires certain sustainability criteria in order to get their local funding. Mm. Um, 
And there's various versions of this kind of popping up in just a handful of countries, really. Um, some countries, I think Norway has a um, one of the a one way to get points is by submitting your sustainability plan. Hmm. Um, so there's there's different ways that sustainability is integrated into um, film tax credits. So this is a more technical question, but I know you guys are delving into scope three, and I don't. This isn't necessarily scope three, but how much you take into account the end life of electric generators and similar electric equipment, like lithium recycling facilities? Like, I mean, I'm sure it's in that dynamic proposal, but if some of these things are, I'm assuming the implication is they're kind of toxic to dispose of, like. So the IRA has really generated a lot of a big market for recycling batteries. Would you just define that? Because we get to Oh, yeah. The Inflation Reduction Act. Um, the large piece of legislation that, uh, was passed a few years ago, um, by Biden and, um, and really had a huge amount of investments in, um, increasing us based manufacturing, um, availability of equipment and incentives and such. And one of the ways to qualify for that is to make sure that, your batteries are sourced from a certain way or made of recycled material. And it's really spurred a lot of new battery recycling plants mm. across, across even North America. So um, cool. the definitely there's a number of life cycle studies out there as well, that even like electric vehicles are still better than gas vehicles Okay, After driving. I can't remember the number of miles right now. I think it depends on how big the battery is on the EV yeah. to get to that, but it's, it's definitely within the early few years of, of yeah, typical use 15, of an EV. Like 15, you only drive 15,000 miles oh for it to God. be better, right? Like, and um, and your electric car is getting cleaner because the electric road keeps getting cleaner. Right. And will continue to get cleaner um, uh, because that's the market, the way the market indicators are going. Um, so there's, there's just a lot of, effort and infrastructure and these these minerals are I guess these metals and minerals are valuable too so recycling them right. is of best interest as well to business so it will it will continue to happen I guess here's one more kind of specific question but Shannon you were saying one of the things that you saw that was promising in New York was that all of a sudden there was more um, kind of companies providing the sort of clean tech that you would hope to see so can you be a little more specific about what that is or what type of like this market that you'd like to see develop more in New York? Yeah. Um, so, so we'd love to see more EVs in general, um, but that has like to rent to, to rent. Well, the, avail the availability of EV cars actually hasn't really been an issue. There's a number of companies that are really coming up with, with those vehicles, which is great. Um, it'll be great as vans and trucks become more available to get those as well. But on the clean mobile power side, I think there are, I could probably count on one hand, the number of large batteries available in mm -hmm. New York okay. and our probably at one time, our productions had them all. Um, and so really just, you know, if you are interested in this and you haven't used them yet, like check them out. Um, and, and they really do help your production provide clean and silent power, you know, less cabling, less fumes, less noise. And um, they are more common um, in places like Vancouver. And now we're using them a lot in LA and Albuquerque and even Atlanta, we're using a number of batteries. But um, now they're now they're finally coming to New York, which is very right. exciting. And, cool. and so I'd love to see more and more of that. And then also, but in order for suppliers to invest in this, productions need to rent them and not just Netflix productions. And that's why it's so great that Audrey at NBCU has so many, you know, great standards too. But I think even if you're out there on independent productions or other, other productions, like really just engaging in this technology and bringing it onto set and trying it out, it's, it is the, the way of the future. Audrey, I'm sure you have more that you could add to that. Yeah, the only other one that I'd love to see more of in general, but um, New York being one of those places are, are hybrid generators. So um, a great kind of um, way to have a single unit rather than carrying a second 
large battery to go with the, the your, your traditional generator, um, but significantly reduces run times on generators because you can you can run on battery for most of your shoot day and then you just turn on the generator for a few hours. Um, and so you'll immediately see fuel savings, um, which is nice and, and not a big change in, in how you you operate or your workflows. It's a kind of random, and I promise I will wrap this up, but here's a kind of random question. Have you guys seen, um, when you think about like, well, what's the barrier to companies like this or these products coming into the city? Have you seen either in New York or in other places, the sound stages kind of stepping into that vacuum and having an inventory? I could see if you were at a sound stage for most of your production days and you went to shoot on location, if they had those that you could rent, you know, um, that could be a market for them. Have you guys seen anything like that? No. Did I come up with a new business model? I was answering a question in the chat and I, oh, okay. I'm so sorry. I won't do that anymore. <laughs> okay. No, that's okay. My question was whether or not sound stages, there might be an opportunity for them in New York to procure some of these kinds of batteries and then rent them themselves as part of the services they're providing to productions who are I'll, I'll renting leave that their to stages. the local suppliers and sound stages to duke it out between them <laughs> rent the equipment. I'm sure there's I'm Those sure there's New York answer. I'm yeah. sure there's partnerships that could be had. Okay. Um I don't know. Does anyone have any clothing thoughts? Anything you guys wanna go around and each give a, a thought to our listeners? Sam. Yeah, I mean, I can just say, uh, you know, one of the things that that I find so impactful about about the coalition that we have is is this ability to break down silos and and do this work. Uh, it's such an interconnected industry to the point uh, that Shannon Andre made before between the workforce and the suppliers and and the way that we all work together. So from the the alliances perspective, from my perspective, I think there's a ton of opportunity for us to continue to recruit more folks into the alliance uh, and, and keep engaging with that. So I think, you know, we're eager to work more closely with other studios and production companies and the unions and the guilds. So continuing to um, develop those relationships. So if you work for one of those places and, and want to get in touch, uh, definitely reach out. But I think, you know, in is there a way they should reach out to you? Do you want to be specific? How they should. should. They, they can out? email me. It's Sam at sustainable entertainment alliance.org. Um, but I, I think in general, like that approach and, and being able to coordinate because there are both a ton of opportunities from working more closely together and a ton of barriers that pop up when we are not aligned. Uh, so that is sort of my plug is for, for more coordination and collaboration across our industry. Awesome. Shannon, Audrey, any closing thoughts? I see questions in the chat uh, asking where where people rent from, and I know there's a lot of suppliers in in the meeting. So if you have equipment available, I would recommend put it in the chat so people can know. Yes. Your, about your equipment, and um, and you could also email me. You all should have my email. Um, if you, because I'll follow up. We will. Th this is being recorded, so we'll upload it to the website. But I can also send out, you know, like a. I think I can send out a transcript of the chat because there's a lot of resources folks have been flagging and then also um, answers to questions. And if people want me to, if there are suppliers on here who want their information shared, I can do that too. I, I guess my final thought is to, it's a, to say it's okay to start small. Like if, if it's, if at least I know I've been hammering on about decarbonization, but if this is new to you and, and new to your production operations, that's okay. You can start small. You can start with some small batteries, some hybrid bat generators. Um, it's okay to start in really safe places until you and your crew and your teams feel really comfortable with it. And, and it does happen pretty quickly. Like once you kind of understand how it works and how to recharge it or how to use it, the benefits come very quickly. So I guess it would just be engaging your teams, engaging your suppliers. Um, this is definitely the way of the future. So, and, and the time to do it is now. So don't, yeah. don't, don't be scared. Just jump in. Yeah, definitely. And I'd say in that spirit of collaboration, um, there's, there's just so many different ways to talk to others um, in your area or in your specialty. 
um, you know, start uh, group texts. There's so many that uh, people on my team are, are members of different WhatsApp groups where people share great information. Um, Todd Moore on my team, who's our uh, sustainable production program manager, um, started in the art department. So he started just researching every material that was in the shop to, to make sure that he could understand the sustainability of it um, and, and sort of made his way into sustainability full time. And so that's just something where I think everyone has the power in the world that you inhabit to make a change, um, find the, the solutions. I think the people who are gonna solve these problems are, are the folks who are, are making those everyday decisions. So um, there's, like Shannon said, there's a lot of opportunity and I think it's, it's an exciting time to, to get involved and, and find those solutions. Yeah, so I guess my final thought is, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Sam, Audrey, and Shannon. It's been a great discussion, and I know it's a lot of time to take to do it, so I really appreciate that. And then, you know, to the spirit of breaking down silos, anyone can always reach out to me, I think, you know, both in the industry and folks who are, um, you know, not at large companies. But I think definitely breaking down these silos, finding ways to collaborate, I think we're all trying to address the issues the same kinds of issues and we have different tools in our toolboxes so the more we can kind of talk to each other uh the brighter the future looks so i want to thank you guys again we're going to be doing these every month um i believe our next one is going to be on waste management a personal favorite topic of mine uh so tune in then and thank you again and i look forward to seeing you all guys at the next office hours take care thanks all thank, thank you, you. bye